All right, you can turn in your King James Bible to Jeremiah chapter 10. Oh, there's a clear condemnation in Scripture against Christmas because the Christmas tree is in, found in Jeremiah chapter 10. All right, verse uh, 3 and 4. Uh, definitely, clearly a Christmas tree. It's a Christmas tree. Well, let's read about that, okay? And we're going to, we're going to go through this in great detail and compare Scripture with Scripture, which these uh, anti-Christmas people couldn't do if their life depended on it. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not, they must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appear, rapper, excuse me, appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into places brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz, the work of the workmen, remember that for later, and of the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are, they are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God, he is the living God, and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. All right, now let me just show you here. I'm going to show you, actually, an old drawing from when I was first newly saved, how I was deceived by this whole thing. Okay, right there, you can see I drew a picture right there. Learn not the way of the heathen, or the way of the heathen, I guess. Yeah, the way of the heathen, I drew a Christmas tree. Um, <clears throat> that's how deceived I was. So if you're some anti-Christmas dumb money out there that uh, thinks that this condemns Christmas trees, well, you're not alone. I thought the same thing for a while. All right? So, see right there. Yeah, my son's right over here. But um, the fact of the matter is, it's not a Christmas tree. Let's go through the passage here and actually look and see what it's saying. First and foremost, verse 1, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O Christian people. Uh, no. Church of the living God. Uh, no. House of Israel. Okay. Um, the house of Israel. He's not talking to Gentile Christians in the New Testament. Okay, so that's problem number one. You're taking something in, that's not even for us dispensationally and you're trying to apply it to us today. That's a big problem right there. You say, well, instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. Okay, let's continue. Uh, <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. All right, what's it talking about there? The heathen are dismayed at the signs of heaven. Why? Because they didn't know God. All they had to look to towards is the stars and the sun and the moon and everything, and they're... I don't know what this means. I, you know, whatever. They're dismayed at the signs of heaven. What were the signs of heaven for? Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. Okay, it says here, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Hmm. Rather interesting, because heathen calendars are based on moon cycles. And I have studied it. And that's why you can't actually have a true heathen calendar, an ancient Celtic calendar or whatever else. Um, because the moon cycles can change from year to year and whatever else. You can't just say, okay, this is the times and whatever. So the ancient people, they just went by the moon and the signs of heaven. That's what they did. God set it up that way. So, oh, those heathens, they, they went by the moon and everything else. Yeah, well, that's how God set it up. You know, and there's new moons mentioned in Colossians chapter 2. So, again, watch out for some of this stuff. Oh, the winter solstice and everything else. Well, you whatever you want to call it, 
it's when the cycles are changing that God set up in Genesis chapter 1. It's not some kind of a, the heathens set up the, the thing of the moon and the sun changing at different times. God set it up that way. But the heathen are dismayed because they're saying, I don't understand. I don't know what this means. You know? Oh no, it's getting darker again. Oh, is this some kind of thing? Are there gods up there? They're in darkness. They don't understand. And we'll see about that here in just a little bit. But it says there, back to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3, For the customs of the people are vain. They're vain. Okay, it doesn't say that they're sinful and horrible and evil and, you know, ritual sacrifices and everything else. It just says that they're vain. The customs of the people are vain. They don't know God. Okay, your ancestors, your heathen ancestors, like my heathen ancestors, if you're from European ancestry or you know, pretty much any Gentile out there. We did things in vain because we didn't know God. Let me show you the verses on that. Acts chapter 17. Go to the New Testament. Acts chapter 17. It's amazing how people forget uh, where they came from and, and whatever else. And they just sit so high and mighty that they can just, you know, condemn everybody that's ever lived and, and everything else. You just kind of forget what the New Testament's all about. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, <clears throat> but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Paul speaking to the Gentiles. And he says, what you were doing in the past back there, making altars to the unknown God, making graven images of, of who you thought to be God and whatever else, God, God winked at that because you were ignorant you were in darkness. You didn't understand things. That's why they're dismayed at the signs of heaven. They're saying, it's getting darker and darker. Do we have to do some kind of thing to appease the gods or God? Or I have no idea. <clears throat> Acts chapter 26. Go to Acts chapter 26 now. Acts chapter 26 and verse 17 and 18. Acts 26 verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. God's saying I'm sending. This is Paul recounting how Jesus spoke this to them. To him on the road to Damascus I should say. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Were the heathens back here in Jeremiah chapter 10, you can go back there, were they in darkness? Yes, they were. <laughs> they were going with what light they had, with whatever they could figure out, and they're being dismayed at the signs of heaven, and they're, I don't understand. Jesus comes, he dies on the cross, and he says, okay, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Bring them out of that darkness. I'm so glad that my ancestors came out of the darkness and into the light. Hmm. But I'm supposed to give up my culture and be a Jew now. No, I'm not. Okay, let's continue here. And here's the, here's the real part here. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. Oh, you say that's just a lumberjack, a logger, you know, which if you don't know anything about me, I have experience of that in my past. Um, you just went and you cut a tree down and that's, that's what it's talking about there. That's not a workman. Okay. How do you know? Look at uh, verse, uh, where's the verse here? Um, verse 9. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphas, the work of the workman. What is it? It's a craftsman, a workman. That's what it's talking about there in context. So the work of the workman of verse 3 is not talking about a guy cutting a tree down. It's not an art, you know, it's, oh, it's an art form to cut a tree down. No, it isn't. <laughs> it's not an art form. What's it talking about there? It's talking about carving so well, you can't carve with an axe. Oh, yes, you can. Look it up. There's a, a, I have a little hatchet. It's a little Japanese carving hatchet. It's Ono brand, O-N-O. -O. 
we always joke about that. We say, oh no, what? I'll let me hold up the hatchet, you know, oh no. Little inside family joke there. But uh, the Grand Force Brooks makes some really nice little carving hatchets. You can make all kinds of things with those at those little hatchets and, and adzes and all these little hand tools. Could you carve a totem pole type of a thing? A Nordic type of god or whatever else? Could you carve that with an axe? Absolutely. And you go back, the ancient Nordic people and whatever else, they were incredibly skilled with their axes. Yeah, they had carving tools back then. The work of the workman on the tree that he cut down. And he carves a God out of it. See, how do you know? Let's keep reading. Okay. Um, verse 4. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Okay, let's focus on the first part. <clears throat> because here's where it's proven that it's a Christmas tree. See, they cut the tree down and then they bring it into the house and they nail it to the floor. I've never heard of anybody doing that, but they nail it to the floor that, so that it doesn't move. They fasten it with nails and a hammer that, that it moves not, and then they deck it with gold and silver. <gasps> oh. oh, well, hey there, uh, genius. Let me ask you a question. Did they have tinsel and silver and gold garland back here in the Old Testament times? Really? <laughs> uh, well... What about the song, Deck the Halls? Uh, ooh, ooh, got you there. Got you there, Denlinger. You stupid heretic, you. You didn't think of that, did you? Oh, actually, uh, yes, I did. Deck the halls with boughs of silver and gold. I thought it was boughs of holly, which would be uh, green plants, green leaves, a little bit jagged with little red berries. I don't think that's silver and gold. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what deck means? If you look it up in the Webster's 1820 Dictionary, it means to cover. You know what one of the old pagan practices is? I'll show you even, I'll even show you some pictures here. You carve a wooden god and then you overlay it, you cover it with gold. If you read the Bible, they were actually doing that in the temple. Carving things out of wood and then covering it with gold. Huh, imagine that. So it's actually not a Christmas tree. It's a god, a, a wooden idol that's uh, carved, and then they put gold over it. I'll show you some pictures. Here you go. Here's some, first of all, we can look at some of the Nordic, uh, the Norse gods and whatever, be it Odin or Thor or whatever else, and they, they build these things, and basically there's some debate whether or not the, the Nordic people were the ones that made totem poles first. And then they brought it over to America and some of their exploration trips. And then the Native Americans started to make their own gods out of totem poles. But that's an interesting question. But the whole point is uh, you can easily carve some of these things with an axe. And then you get into Egypt. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of this. And here's some, you know, different things. And it's plainly saying that it's carved out of wood and then overlaid with gold. The modern word would be gilded. All right. Uh, they would gild. They would put the gold over top. Um, again, a statue of Buddha with some of the gold, you know, peeling off of it and whatever else. And another one here that's for sale and very expensive. Wooden, it's made out of teak and then covered, teak is a type of wood, um, made out of teak and then covered with gold, decked with gold. And you can look up other pictures. They also did it with silver. You take the silver and the gold and you pound the metal very, very thin so it becomes just a, like an aluminum foil type of a thing. And then you can heat it and you can put it onto the, the statue or whatever that you've carved out of wood. And you can affix it to it. So the thing looks like it's solid gold, but it's really just gold plated. Is all it is. Gilded on there. Again, you, you know, people do it today, this very day. You have fancy signs and whatever else with scroll work and things. And they'll put gold gilding on it. A picture frame that has gold gilded picture frame. It's the same thing. It's thousands of years old, this technology. Make it out of wood, cover it with gold. That's what's going on in Jeremiah chapter 10. It's not a Christmas tree with, you know, cheap gold and silver tinsel that they got at Walmart. You know? <laughs> but see, 
in order to make the, the Christmas, uh, how dare you celebrate Christmas? The anti-Christmas people have to lie about Jeremiah chapter 10 because that's the strongest text that they have. Without Jeremiah chapter 10, their whole system falls apart. Oh, the Christmas tree, it's the heathen, the way of the heathen. We'll talk about that too. What is the way of the heathen? Okay, now look at this again. Um, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Um, you don't need to fasten down a Christmas tree with nails and hammer, all right, that it doesn't move. You might have a little base or whatever that you put around the thing, stick it in a bucket with a bunch of rocks and some water in it if it's a live tree or a little metal base or something if it's an artificial tree. Or, but you don't need to hammer it down to the floor. I mean, I've never even heard of anybody doing that. But what about an idol? Yeah, pretty big thing that you have to get that thing hammered down. You want that stationary because it's going to be there for a while. Again, you don't just, let's hammer down the tree so we can take it up in a month or a few days or something like that. Again, I knew people that, you know, some people put up the Christmas tree right around, right after Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving Day and leave it up till January sometime. I've known other people that would put up the Christmas tree Christmas Eve and then take it down after Christmas Day is over. Every man's per fully persuaded in his own mind, you know. Um, but I never heard anybody just nailing it to the floor. But if you have a pagan god that has been, you've gone to all the work of carving it with your axe, getting that thing carved just right, and then you overlay it, you cover it, you deck it with gold and silver, yeah, you would want that thing nailed down. It has some little bit of value there being covered in gold and silver. Think, people. <laughs> Think. But look at... Uh, the next verse, they are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. Why couldn't they just say they are upright as the fir tree, if it is a fir tree? Why would they compare it to a palm tree, if it's a tree? The fir tree is upright like the palm tree. Uh, no, uh, it's talking about a statue of a man, a, like the ones I was showing earlier. It's some kind of a totem pipe pole type of thing or some kind of an idol that's actually standing there. They're upright as the palm tree. It would make no sense to compare a tree with a tree. They're comparing an idol to a tree. But, verse 5 here, but speak not. Again, all these anti-Christmas people, please show me one person that's ever thought that the Christmas tree is going to speak to them. You know? I mean, maybe you could find some nut out there. There's Nuts are a dime a dozen now, as far as people are concerned. People are crazy. But uh, if there is somebody out there that believes their Christmas tree could talk to them. But uh, what's it talking about? It's talking about an idol, a statue that has a mouth carved into it. Standing there, you know, whatever. They're upright as a palm tree, but they speak not. They don't speak. They have mouth, but there's no words coming out of it. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Why would you, you know, be born, meaning, in other words, you move it from place to place. Why would you do that with a Christmas tree? I mean, think, people, think, think, think. They must needs be born. You don't, you don't move a Christmas tree from room to room or from house to house or take it down through the town or whatever. You don't carry a Christmas tree on your shoulders or whatever, but the Catholics carry their statues of Mary around the processionals where they take around the statues of Mary or the monstrance or whatever. Other people, they'll carry their, their statue of Buddha or whatever else and they carry it around. It's talking about an idol. It's not talking about a Christmas tree. And these anti-Christmas people, if you're going to perpetuate that lie, um, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. And if you've been deceived by Doc Marquis or any of these other devils out there that are coming out with all this stuff, you better repent. And you better quit telling that lie. Uh, okay, let's look at the next part here of verse 5. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Don't be afraid of them. It's, they, they can't do evil, they can't do good. And I said this way back in my original study about... Uh, Answering Christmas criticisms. Okay, I still have the exact gun that I used back then. All right. 
scary black gun look at that looking right down the barrel isn't that awful and right there it's got the little the little thing out there on the side the the indicator i don't know if you can see that right there that sticks out meaning there's a round in the chamber watch this it's going to start shooting people just hold on i'm not going to touch the trigger it's going to start shooting people at, well i'll do it this way i'll point out towards the street watch it's going to start shooting people no, it's an inanimate object. It's not good or evil. It's just a bunch of metal and, and polycarbonate and whatever else, um, gunpowder and things. It's, it's inanimate. I have to be the one that actually puts my hand on the thing, puts my finger through the trigger and starts shooting. Whether I'm good or evil, I will use this thing for good or evil. Right? An idol is not good or evil. It's an inanimate object. Just wood covered with gold or silver or whatever else. That's all that it is. And again, this guilt by association argument that these anti-Christmas people use. Oh, you know, I guess if you celebrate Christmas, you're, you teach your children about Santa Claus. And you teach all this other pagan stuff and everything else. And you must be having sacrifice rituals at your home. And if you have a Glock, you must be a murderer. You must go out and kill people, you know. No, the only thing that that gun's ever killed is uh, paper. And I think I shot a lock off of one of my sheds the one time because I forgot my keys. I did actually, I don't know where the thing's at in here, but I have a lock someplace. I'll have to show it sometime. But uh, you know, it's never killed anybody. And I hope I never have to use it to, for a defensive purpose like that. See, but that's what this whole thing of the idols is, is about. We're not supposed to be afraid of idols. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, how about a New Testament tie-in? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 4 through 13. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. How did Paul say we know that there is, that the, we know that an, an idol is nothing in the world? What's he referring to? Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 there, verse uh, 5. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Did you find it? Okay, bring it over. My son, he's over here looking for the lock that I shot off with the, the Glock there, the 45 auto. Um, I'll, I'll show him. Uh, literally one building. It was actually for Christmas. My son wanted to have um, some of my old stuffed animals. He wanted to be able to have them you know, with him for Christmas. And so I said, okay, we'll go the whole way down. Drove an hour and a half away down to our property where I had some storage buildings built at the time um, that I built myself, little uh, sheds that I built so we could store some of our stuff. And went, got the whole way down, realized, oh, I forgot my keys at home. and I, oh, I'm not driving the whole way back. And I thought, how am I going to get in? I thought, well, I'll just have to buy new padlocks or something. So I literally got over beside the one edge of the shed and aimed with my gun and uh, then cocked the hammer. I'm thinking we have another one. <laughs> but I, their striker fired but another issue, but I aimed and I kind of went like this, you know, so I wouldn't get hit by shrapnel. And I, and I shot about, yeah, it was probably about four or five feet away from the, the lock. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to hit it aimed and I went and I shot and it blew the lock right off. Right there it is with the lead bullet still sticking in it right there. Busted the thing out. So there's the lock that I had to shoot off on Christmas Eve. So my son would have a special little Christmas gift there. Um, that was in 2017, Christmas of 2017. Uh, so there you have it. And before you think, oh man, you must be a great shot. Well, I tried to shoot a lock off the other shed because it turned out the one I was, went into first, it wasn't even in that one. It was in the other one. <laughs> so then I went and I tried to shoot that one off and and uh, I shot about four or five rounds and didn't, couldn't hit it, couldn't hit the thing. <laughs> so uh, actually had to use an axe on that one, but then I had to get new locks. But 
silly things you do, you know, all for the love of a child. But uh, continuing here, um, an idol isn't anything, brethren. It isn't some kind of a thing, even if the Christmas tree was the idol that's being referred to in Jeremiah 10, and it's not. But even if it was, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean one thing at all. So, you know, oh, it's just this terrible thing and you just have to forsake it and whatever. Come on. Come on. You're going against liberty. You're going against the spirit of the Lord when you do that. It doesn't matter. We should be able to get together as brethren and, hey, these brethren over here, they don't do Christmas. Okay, don't say anything about it to them. Us over here, we do it. Great, praise the Lord. These brethren over here are vegetarian. We over here, we eat meat. Okay, don't hang our meat over here. Hey, look at this. You know, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Peace. We're supposed to have peace. Well, I'm going to destroy Denlinger's ministry behind his back because he doesn't come out against Christmas then you don't understand the liberty that's supposed to be there in the body of Christ. Yeah, we love to get Christmas cards from our viewers. We've gotten some really beautiful ones. We keep them. We still have some of them hanging up. You know, just look at them. The beautiful winter scenery and everything else. We love that stuff. It's happy. It's nice. You know, other brethren, they, they contact us and say, hey, we don't do anything for Christmas, but keep going, brother. Well, praise the Lord. I don't look and say, oh, you don't do anything for Christmas? Stinking heretic. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Quit being so stinking divisive, you wicked people out there. If you're genuinely saved, then the Lord will convict you of that divisiveness that you're spreading and trying to destroy the ministry here. He will convict you of that. Um, let's continue. Verse 5. For though there be that are called uh, gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are, are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto idol, unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Right? There are some people that, that uh, could get messed up with the wrong kind of stuff at Christmas, and whenever they're having some wild party at their job, eh, you probably want to stay away from the wild party and whatever else. Verse 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. How don't you people get the liberty issue there? If you eat, you're not better. If you don't eat, you're not the worse. Whatever. Be fully persuaded in your own mind. Doesn't matter. Quit fighting about it. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Be careful what you do, that you're not making a hypocritical thing that somebody else gets messed up. Some guy has a problem with alcohol. Just say this. And you go in and you say, I'm going to get a bottle of wine or something. The Bible condemns drunkenness, doesn't condemn wine. But, you know, I'm careful when I say that. Because there are some brethren out there that have a problem with alcoholism. They had a problem with it in their past. Well, then stay away from alcohol. Me personally, I've had wine on occasions and things like that. But I think it's disgusting. I think it tastes like cough syrup. Uh, I'll never waste another cent in my entire life on wine. I think it's stupid. Okay, but some brother wants to have some wine or whatever for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities, like Paul recommended to Timothy. Okay, you make your own wine, you make your own fermented type of drink, and don't get drunk with it, but you're doing that, oh, fine, whatever. Right? You want to go and you, you have some, uh, some kind of a thing, There's a you want to get some chicken or whatever else that the Catholic Church is selling in your area with their idols and everything, their shrines to marry and things and you say what well, you know i'm just going to go get some chicken from them or okay go ahead but if there's some catholic in the area that you're witnessing to don't let them see you going over to that catholic church and getting some chicken you see you see how the thing works out you're thinking about other people that's why i celebrate christmas because it's about other people it's not about me it's about my dear little son it's about my wife i think about things i can do for them to make it nice for them. I remember my grandfather, 
my maternal grandfather, we called him Pop Pop, um, he would spend literally months getting ready for Christmas. And we'd go there and it was just this amazing feast. He'd have all different types of meat laid out, summer sausage and, and uh, you know, the lunch meat type of things, you know, ham and chipped ham and turkey and roast beef. And, and he would have all this stuff. Then he'd have a, a thing of mixed nuts there and, and he'd have different types of crackers, all different kinds of cheese and cookies of all kinds that he made and everything else. He loved Christmas. He adored Christmas because it was a time when he gave him of himself. He esteemed other people better than himself. And it was so special to him. I remember that. He died in 2009, but I remember that. that he would always say, just 31 more days. He'd say, huh? What? He said, until Christmas. And he'd smile. Meant a lot to him. He was caring for other people. Verse 11, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Hey, here's one for you anti-Christmas people. You know what? Your anti-Christmas lies against something that's a very dear, near and dear tr tradition to me. They make me to be offended. You offend me by that. Are you going to stop doing it? Well, no, because I... Okay, then you're wrong. You're in the wrong. You come over here, you get into fellowship with me, and you say, I don't want anything to do with Christmas. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to respect that. I'm not going to wish you Merry Christmas. I'm not going to take you in and say, oh, here's our tree and whatever. No. Hey, don't turn the lights on while they're here. That's fine. The children, they don't want to be around. The, okay, fine. To Turn the Christmas music off, whatever else. I mean, and again, I pointed this out many years ago. What do you do with the, the hymns about the birth of Jesus Christ? Hark the herald angels sing. Joy to the world, O come all ye faithful, away in a manger. What do you do with that stuff? It's pagan. Really? <laughs> really? It's weird. It's really weird. I mean, read the lyrics to Hark the herald angels sing. It's a beautiful, very deep, profound hymn. But you have to get rid of it, don't you? Yeah. All right. Back to our text in Jeremiah chapter 10. Make sure you're doing things, living your life, that you're thinking about other people. That's charity. If you're a dad, you get to work at this time of the year and you say, you know what? I'd like to do something nice for my wife and children. What could we do? What special little traditions could we come up with? For years, we used to drive to the town of Holton here in northern Maine. They had this beautiful, I think it was a blue spruce or something tree, and they'd decorate it just lovely, beautiful. And uh, we'd go up there and we'd take pictures. You know, my wife holding Oliver, you know, when he was just a newborn baby, the first Christmas that he was alive. And we'd go every year and we'd take a picture there, <laughs> Christmas Eve, every year. And uh, we stopped doing it because we had a couple years where we didn't get snow and it was kind of a, uh, you know, but family traditions. I remember being a boy and, and my dad would say, sometimes just out of the blue, spontaneous, you know, after supper he'd say, okay, everybody get your coats on. Huh? We're going to go, we're going to go look at Christmas lights. And we'd drive around and there was an old man in the town of Strasburg down in Pennsylvania where I grew up and he had his house that was just covered in Christmas lights and, that, you know, the little plastic snowmen and whatever else out there in the front yard and, and things. That meant something to me. You go past his house, and he'd have a little donation thing out there, and we'd go and put coins in his little don to help him pay for his electric bill. <laughs> That's what it was. I mean, literally, please donate to help me pay for the electric bill. And uh, you'd go out there, and you'd put some coins in, and, and you'd hear the your little song playing. You know, ding, 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 ding. Beautiful. Snow starting to slowly fall. I remember that stuff. I'm glad my dad took time to give me a special childhood at Christmas. I'm glad my dad wasn't some kind of a tightwad nut that said that Christmas was evil and horrible and whatever else. You have some culture, they say, well, we don't really do Christmas. Okay, fine. Again, I'm not condemning you. You're fine. You don't want to do it. That's fine. But I, what I go after is these anti-Christmas people that lie and lie and turn people against other brethren and cause division in the body of Christ because of this Christmas issue. That's what ticks me off. 
And I'll part company with every single one of you, and I will name you. You're wicked. Jeremiah chapter 10. Look down at, uh, I think it's verse, where is it here? Um, verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 8. They are all together brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Okay? Um, They're all together brutish and foolish. What's he talking about? The heathen here. Jeremiah, writing under the inspiration of God, he's talking about the heathen, and he says they're brutish and foolish. Okay? What's that a reference to? Well, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're done there in Jeremiah chapter 10, so you can take your finger out of there if you want, if you were holding your hand there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14, verse 11. Paul's talking about speaking in tongues here. He says, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now you look up the word barbarian, it's talking about people that are outside the city that are kind of uncivilized, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what it's talking about. And it's not just all the Northern Europeans. No, it's anybody. It could be an African, it could be, you know, whatever. Anybody out there, be like John the Baptist would be, a, would be considered kind of a barbarian type of a guy <laughs> out there, you know, with animal hides on and you're eating wild locusts and honey and things. Those of us that are that are away from the, all the civilized culture of the world would be like a barbarian. Uh, you say, well, those those are the wicked people, those that celebrated Yule, the Druids and the witches and the and these Norse pagans and everything and and all their stuff. They're just evil, wicked people. Really? Is that what the Bible says? Let's look at that. Acts chapter twenty-eight. Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Miletus, or, or excuse me, Melita. And the barbarous, barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Hmm. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet, suffer, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Did these people, uh, were they good people? They did us no little kindness. They were kind. They were hospitable. They did nice things even though they were barbarians. Hmm. And uh, did they have some moral understanding? Yeah, they look at Paul and they say, oh, okay, that snake bit him. Well, obviously there's a reason for that. And to them they would have probably said, I, I guess the gods are judging that guy and whatever else because he's obviously very wicked. They see a punishment for sin. Hmm. Verse 6. Howbeit they looked when he should have fall, swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. These people were ignorant. They're looking there saying, they see a miracle and they say, wait a second here, this guy should have died. I thought he was really wicked, but he didn't die. He must be a god. <laughs> and you go down through the chapter. We're not going to read the rest of it there, but they're kind to them. You know what? That's the way it is with my ancestors. With me being a of Northern European descent, uh, even the worst people out there still have somewhat of a hospitable nature to them in Europe and whatever else. They're not just these evil just running around with, which, with knives trying to sacrifice anybody that they find or whatever else to their pagan gods to appease things. That's not the history of my people. That's nonsense. And all this stuff of, well, the the pagan rituals and everything else and all these sacrifices and all this, um, you know, that that's there. What's your proof? Something that some Catholic like Snorri Sturluson wrote in the poetic Eddas or the, 
or the sagas and things over there. That's all the, the proof that you have. Show me any different than that. Going back to, you know, early 13th century. Where did the information come from? Well, we read from Catholic sources. That's kind of an odd thing, too, because you have these anti-Christmas people, and they'll say that the Catholics are behind Christmas, and we can prove that all this other stuff is bad because we read from Catholic sources to prove that it's bad. Okay, yeah. Um, or you can just say, you know what? Those people were in darkness. I was once in darkness. We didn't sacrifice any children. We weren't uh, going around sacrificing people. and, and uh, We were just in darkness, like a lot of lost people. And Christmas was a wonderful, beautiful thing and whatever else. We did things that were kind for people, showed us no little, little kindness. Yeah? And by the way, before you get too rough on the uh, ancient heathen for uh, sacrificing and doing all this other stuff, you might want to actually read the Old Testament sometime and realize they were sacrificing animals too. Now, they were doing it to God, certainly, but uh, all this, you know, scare tactic stuff of these former Illuminati guys that came out in the 1980s and, and things, um, all these scare tactics they brought out about ritual sacrifice and everything, uh, there was a lot of cultures that did that. You say, well, yes, but the, the pagan, the heathens, they did, uh, <clears throat> you know, human sacrifices. Um, well, I recall the story in the Old Testament of a man, I forget his name, Jephthah or something like that. And um, he goes out to battle and he says, you know, Lord, if you help me to win this battle, when I return home, the first thing that passes the door of my house, I will offer it up as a burnt sacrifice to you. And he gets home and his only daughter, daughter, walks by and he's, oh, no, you know, and I have to sacrifice you. And she says, okay, let me go bewail my virginity and then you can sacrifice me. And he does. He does. What do you do with that? Well, you just pretend that that stuff doesn't exist in the Old Testament. Let's not talk about that. Let's just kind of turn, you know, and, and we won't talk about that. And the Jews, a lot of times, too, it wasn't just that in that situation where God actually told him to do that, but you also have the Jews that are going and following after other gods. And yet God's blessing is still there upon them many times. God doesn't just wipe them out as a people and say, okay, I'm starting over, you know, Moses in there and he's up in the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and he comes back down and they're naked dancing and things like that and they have this golden calf, you know. God doesn't say, well, I'll just wipe them all out and we'll start over. No. There's a promise here to these children of Israel. So, hopefully you understand the point I'm trying to make there. Um, all this weird uh, Illuminati exposed and everything else, I fell for a lot of that stuff early on. And, you know, is there an Illuminati? Probably I think that there, you know, is something there to that, but you know, it's more just the Catholic Church and the knighthoods of the Catholic Church. It's not really. Don't worry about the Illuminati. That's just a distraction. You know, it's just Roman Catholicism and those that are high up in business that have the knighthoods and the Jesuits and the all the different people, Knights of Malta, Knights of the Equestrian Order, you know, whatever Knights Templar and the Freemasons and all the other fraternal organizations. That's what the enemy is. It's this Illuminati stuff. <laughs> Uh, just one little part of the whole deal. Um, <clears throat> but these guys, they came out and they were spreading all this hysteria. And I'm firmly convinced of that. Johnny Todd, jo Doc Marquis, Bill Schneblin, all these guys, they're all screwballs. They all are. They get into all this weird stuff and people get all messed up by them and everything. I think there's something really big going on there, but you know, I can't. I haven't done the research totally into all that stuff yet. But um, we're supposed to have liberty their brethren. And it's not some kind of a horrible satanic conspiracy if you celebrate Christmas by giving gifts one to another and having a nice meal, getting together with family and friends if you can still get along with them. <laughs> uh, it's not a problem. Not a problem. You want to meet with some brethren and they say, hey, we don't really do the Christmas. Okay, fine. That's, that's okay. We won't push our culture on you. Don't push yours on us. That's the teaching of the, of the Bible the New Testament, for us as Christians. So I hope that you um, will take heed to this. Um, because, again, I've, I've seen this. It's one of the devil's tactics. These people 
that they go off on liberty and they don't come back. Um, they'll go off and, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're going posty, they're getting into Calvinism, they're getting into all kinds of other weird heresies. Um, because you're basically shutting out the Holy Spirit of God when you go into this radical anti-Christmas thing where you're attacking people that don't agree with you. I mean, somebody's saying, yeah, nah, not really into it. Again, I have to keep saying this over and over again. Somebody that says, oh, not really a big deal. Christmas isn't really a big thing. That's fine, completely. Not a problem. Somebody says, I'd like, you know, some aspects of Christmas is fine and whatever else. Okay, you know, not a big deal. So, you know, we're getting into this time of the year again, and I'm seeing it already in the comments and, and things of the videos and, and whatever else, and Christmas is pagan, you know. And, and now you say, well, hey, Merry Christmas to everybody out there. Howard, you obviously don't understand the pagan origins and things. Well, actually, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, and when you look at it and you examine Jeremiah chapter 10, it's not about a Christmas tree. It's a pagan idol, clearly a pagan idol. And if you believe it's a Christmas tree and you're still going to cling to that, then you're a liar. You're a deceiver. Um, so if you're seeing a lot of this anti-Christmas stuff, um, I would run away from it, quite frankly, because they're lying to you. It is a liberty issue. It does not matter. You can. You don't have to. <laughs> it's the same as if there's some quote-unquote Christian ministry out there that's run by some vegetarian and he's attacking eating meat and saying it's your sin if you're eating meat. Uh, I'd run away from that too. Okay, that's a doctrine of devils, commanding to abstain from meats. Um, so don't get sidetracked on this stuff, brethren. And uh, if you're out there, again, you know, I've, I've had a number of people and they've been writing me and they say, brother, you know, I really got into this cult, this sect of these guys that are anti-Christmas. And they just, I remember the one, they said, brother, they hate you. They said they just despise you. They hate everything about you. They just, when, you know, they're not on video and whatever else and their Skype conversations and whatever else, they just tear, they say, they just tear you, Brother Brian. They tear you up and down. They hate your guts. Well, that's really the spirit of the Lord there. Um, don't fall for it. And uh, if you're one of these anti-Christmas guys and you're just going to stand by your stands and convictions that are lies, um, then I don't want anything to do with you. And uh, don't even try to support this ministry. Don't try to recommend my ministry, whatever else. Go away. Uh, go crawl back under the rock that you live under. All right. So that's going to be it. Um, enjoy the holiday season. It, you know, I realize a lot of us, I can't get together with my family anymore. I uh, used to enjoy the big family get togethers and, you know, my grandparents and all my aunts and uncles and all my cousins and everything. But that world's gone. It's totally gone, especially now with the, you know, forced inoculation thing. Uh, I don't want to be around relatives that are inoculated. Uh, no, thank you. Um, so, you know, but if you can get together with family, uh, some family members that are of like mind and whatever else, well, praise the Lord. Have a good time. If it's just you and your wife and your children, have a neat time of fellowship. Um, listen to the songs. Don't listen to, you know, Santa Claus songs. That's an idiotic thing. I actually teach my son about Santa Claus. We always give him a hard time. We, you know, we have a six inch stove pipe, you know, in our, in our tiny house, it goes up and out. And I say, you better be good because if you don't Santa Claus, you know, or Santa Claus is going to come down Christmas Eve down that six inch stove pipe through the stove and come out with your presence. <laughs> and what do you think about that? Stand up. He's here on the floor with me. What do, you th what do you think about Santa Claus? I think it's very stupid. Well, I forced you to say that, right? Did I force no. you to say that? No. <laughs> All right. You hop down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very stupid. All oh, this is just terrible. But, you know, don't mess with Santa Claus. Don't mess with that other stuff. You can have certain things about Christmas that are very special, very nice. You say, well, we don't want to do materialistic stuff. Okay, then make presents for each other. Do nice things for each other. Um, go on out and, and do, you know, if you have a lot of children, you know, have the children learn to do each other's chores and things just as a way to help each other out. It can be a beautiful time. Wonderful. Um, you don't have to just condemn it and whatever else. <laughs> so I can keep going off about this subject because it's something that really makes me angry because I've seen so many people literally 
call me a false prophet and I'm not a real preacher and I'm not even saved and whatever else because I am not against Christmas. Stupid. And this study has conclusively proved that Jeremiah chapter 10 has nothing to do with a fir tree with lights and tinsel on it or something. It has nothing to do with that at all. all right? So that is going to be it for this study. Um, in this really depressing time out there, it's nice to have Christmas. If you're single, whatever else, well, go out and you just do some tracting or whatever else. Um, maybe look forward to the time the Lord will give you a wife and children and, and then think about the neat times that you can have with them. You know, nothing will get a, a baby more excited than seeing the beautiful lights blinking on and off. And the, you know, it's a wonderful time of the year. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And you have anything else to say? Uh, don't know. You don't know? Right. You don't want to say Merry Christmas or anything? Oh, Merry Christmas. Can you say it again? Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Merry Christmas.